Hello everyone, and welcome to the first proper episode of my NES emulator project, or reboot really. I took an extended break from the project to focus on classes, and when I came back to it I decided I wanted to do things a bit differently. Anyway, in the preview I explained my decision to start this project, and I'm still happy with that explanation, so in today's episode I think I'll just dive right in and start coding. First, I need to do some very basic setup, creating the respective classes that'll form the first two main modules of the emulator, those being the memory map and the CPU. This is nearly the same as the first attempt, however I decided to swap the order and create the memory map first so that the CPU could have something to read and write from, rather than creating that later and then going back to the CPU. The default class behavior, however, is not ideal for this project. Each class would have its own independent copy of the other modules. Instead, I need each module to create a single instance to share among the other classes. The easiest option would be to just dump all the modules into one monolithic structure and not even worry about classes. For a project of this complexity, that would quickly become unwieldy and difficult to maintain. To make it work, I'm just modifying the classes into a singleton design, where each one manages its own instance. Now I'm ready to create a very basic memory map, and although this isn't the final implementation, I at least want something that generally reflects the NES's architecture. I will divide it into separate memory regions and handle address mirroring, but for the sake of testing I'll just treat everything as if it were writable memory. For now I'm just letting my compiler store all this memory on the stack. This really isn't the best for such large blocks of data, and I can already hear you guys yelling at me in the comments, but it should at least be fine long enough to get the CPU working and then I'll come back and fix everything and get a proper memory map working. Thank you. 
With that, I think it's finally time to start working on the CPU. I'll start with its six internal registers and work my way up from there. My reference materials will be linked in the description for anyone who wishes to follow along. I'll start these registers off with the program counter and accumulator, used to keep the processor's place when executing code and carry results from one operation to the next. Then we have two general purpose registers, X and Y, which can also be used as offsets to affect what addresses are read from or written to. After that we have the status flags, followed by the stack pointer, which maps to a specialized region of memory that's often used when calling or returning from subroutines. Now that the registers are in place, I should probably create a simple debug function to print their values. I haven't completely planned out how to format it, but I at least want to be able to see that things update correctly as the program progresses, and this function will probably evolve alongside the rest of the program. There's no built-in way to print binary. Oh well, I'll deal with that later. Since all seven flags are condensed into a single byte, it'd be nice to have some helper functions prepared to read and write to them individually. That'll be much more reliable than reinventing the wheel every time, so I'll go ahead and create those now.
this is where this attempt really differs from the last one. I'll create the addressing modes now, and then the actual CPU instructions. I did that in the reverse order last time, and while I probably could have made it work, this way just seems more efficient. I won't give all the addressing modes their own functions, though. Some are only used with a handful of instructions, and I'll handle those when I get to them. Others operate entirely with the CPU and never touch the memory map so separate functions won't be very helpful for those. For the modes that I think are worth implementing now, I'm creating functions to return the address where the operand can be found. This way these functions can be used to both read and write to memory, cutting out some redundancy later. At this point I should probably create a framework to test the addressing modes, so I'll go ahead and do that.
Now I'll create and test the rest of the addressing modes. I'll get back to you when I'm finished.
I realized that each addressing mode used a fixed number of bytes to indicate where the operand can be found. If I just increment the program counter here, then I won't need to worry about it later, and I save the error-prone task of handling it almost 150 times when decoding the raw opcodes. Now I can further condense these into a pair of functions to read and write memory, once again shaving off some error-prone redundancies in the process. With all that support logic out of the way, it's finally time to start the fun part of this episode, replicating the CPU's instruction set. I'll start with some of the simplest instructions, which just shuffle data around within the CPU and between the CPU and memory.
the next few instructions are even simpler, since they just move data around within the CPU and don't touch main memory, I don't need to worry about addressing modes, I can just copy the data and be done. Next I'll look at a special class of transfer instructions that push and pull data from the stack. Although I don't need to worry about addressing modes for these, I do still need to pay attention to the stack pointer and store values in memory. I'm up to the first bit of arithmetic. This isn't the most interesting thing yet, just incrementing or decrementing values by one, but I'm definitely getting close to the more complex instructions that really manipulate data. After that brief taste, I'm up to the more fully-featured arithmetic instructions. 
As you can see, the 6502 only supported addition and subtraction in hardware, so all other operations needed to be done in software. This is also where the standard 6502 differs from the 2A03 used in the NES. The section that handled binary coded decimal was disabled, and only normal binary numbers are supported. This makes my work a bit easier, as I only need to support one set of carry logic. Next I'll implement the bitwise operations. These are fairly simple and thankfully have very direct equivalents in modern C++. This saves me a bit of work.
Next, I'll handle the instructions that shift bits left and right within a byte of memory. Each direction has a few variants depending on how wrapping is handled for the bit that's shifted out, as well as whether to shift memory or the CPU's own accumulator. And now those are mostly working, so I just need to set the appropriate flags. Now that the four instructions are working on the accumulator, I'll just copy and modify them to shift memory in the same ways.
climb up to the instructions to set or clear flags as the programmer needs. These should be super easy since I made those helper functions earlier. This one and its corresponding clear operation aren't even useful on the 2IO3 since decimal mode was omitted. I'm not sure if the flag's even maintained on this variant. Before I get much further, I'm going to go through the existing operations in a bit more detail and make sure I didn't miss any flags. I also went ahead off camera and created a simple enumerator to hold the bit numbers for each flag so that I don't need to keep referencing the table. The conversion really isn't anything fancy, just a lot of find and replace. With that out of the way, I can return to implementing the remaining instructions, and comparisons are next. On real hardware, they would have been performed as a subtraction without storing the result, but in C++ it's easier to just compare the results and set the flags accordingly. Fittingly, I will implement conditional branches next. These often use the results of the comparisons that I just finished working on, and things are starting to get interesting again as I need to figure out how I want to handle the relative offset. I'm just checking my documentation here to make sure I understand how the offset actually works.
Now that that's working, I'll just copy it over to the other seven conditions, and branching will be finished. After that, I'm up to unconditional jumps. These are a bit easier as it just jumps to an absolute address, no relatives offsets or the like. Okay, jump to subroutine may be a bit complicated since I need to push the return address to the stack, but that shouldn't be too hard.
this is harder than I thought. I wasn't thinking about what would happen if the stack pointer were to wrap around. It's not too bad, though. I'll just create another helper function to handle each push and pull correctly, rather than try to cheat this two-byte case. I'm almost done with the instruction set, or at least the part the programmer dealt with. I'll implement the two software interrupt operations next. These instructions function similarly to jumping and returning from subroutines, except that the target is always stored in the same address at the very end of ROM, in bytes FFFE and FFFF.
just two instructions left and they're fairly simple. Bit test did confuse me a bit at first, but it's basically just checking, hey, are any of these bits set at a given memory location? And no op is even simpler, literally just telling the CPU to do nothing for two clock cycles. With the main instruction set out of the way, I'm going to return to interrupts for a moment, as I still have hardware interrupts to deal with. Programmers can't trigger these interrupts directly, instead they're triggered by the status of external components. I'll start with the first specialized interrupt the 6502 ever performs. When reset, the processor spends 7 cycles initializing itself to a known state so it can begin executing code. It expects the values stored at addresses FFFC and FFFD to point to the beginning of executable code.
Next, I'll handle interrupt requests. These add a bit of complexity as I need to check whether the interrupt disable flag is set, and the target address is stored in FFFA and FFFB this time. Other than those small changes, it shouldn't be too different from the break instruction I implemented earlier. Finally, I'll handle non-maskable interrupts. With the exception of the break flag, these function identically to the break instruction, and the target address should be FFFE and FFFF. tedious part of this project. I need to map these instructions to their 150 valid opcodes. This won't be fun at all, so I'll just throw on some music and run through it as fast as my editor allows.
I spent quite a while off camera double and triple checking the instruction count. 
I should have 105 unrecognized opcodes, not 106. After more cross-checking, I finally figured out which instruction I was missing. Transfer X to stack pointer. I'll just fix that and then the CPU should be fully implemented and capable of executing code. Thanks everyone for watching, I realize this episode was a bit dry with little to show. I promise it'll get better from here. Next time I plan to load an actual ROM file and then start working on the picture processing unit so we can all have something to look at. <laughs>